Hello and welcome to this, the fourth lecture in the series of lectures covering basic masonry construction. This lecture will outline some of the issues which might be encountered when working with existing buildings. In the previous lectures we talked about how the buildings we see around us form part of our inheritance from previous generations. And as such they help shape our national and regional identities. We also briefly discussed how the form and shape of buildings from the past can help us understand how to design for the future. As we established that a significant number of the buildings we'll be working on in the future are already here, this will have a knock-on effect in the built environment careers in the future. So new specialisms and skills will have to be developed and we'll have to understand and rediscover some of the old skills from the past. The fundamental question we need to ask is, what can we do to existing buildings? There are really only four answers to this question, obviously excluding the difficult answer of knocking them down, um, which we want to avoid. We can adapt them and change their purpose. We can extend them to increase the area or the volume to make them more useful. We could refurbish them by stripping out the old parts which no longer suit our needs and replacing them with shiny new bits. Or we could repair them incrementally, keeping the character of the building as close to the original as possible. For each of these options, we need to think about a few key points related to how the buildings are made. The structure of a building will have a large impact on how extensive any work to it can practically be. If the structure is difficult or expensive to alter, it can mean that the scope of any work will be limited. The range of construction and the materials used can likewise dictate how the building can be altered. And in historic buildings, this is likely to be closely linked to how we view the character of the building. Performance of historic buildings by modern standards are likely to be poor but many older properties rely on air moving around the construction to deal with moisture. So altering how this system works could have detrimental effects on the longevity of the materials. Aesthetic brings most of these elements together. The outward appearance of historic buildings is inseparable from the construction and any changes we make to existing buildings will likely change the aesthetic, so this should be carefully considered. In addition to the technical aspects of the building, we also need to consider the use and the aspirations of the client. If we're changing the function, <coughs> if we're changing the function of a building or space, we might need to think about whether this change will require any specific design considerations. Adapting a building will always provide opportunities to improve accessibility. The aesthetics of the building can be difficult for some to assess. Students early in their studies often talk about blending in because to create a carbon copy of an existing building seems to be the easiest option. This is rarely satisfactory and often old looking new buildings will have a strange Disneyland feel. Slightly easier to understand is the notion of quality. We can look at an existing building, study the quality of its construction and materials, and choose how our new materials sit alongside the existing. It can be a difficult balance as adding to an existing building can cheapen it, harmonize with it, or outcompete it. If we look at an example and consider the great court at the British Museum, completed by Foster and Partners, a new interior space was created by covering what had previously been an external space with a high-tech glass structure. Technically, there might have been considerations as to how the existing walls, which had previously been exposed to the outside, might function, because they would no longer have the opportunity to breathe moisture to the outside air. Covering the walls to the courtyard also freezes them in time. The walls which face the outside of the building will continue to age and gather dirt and be washed with water. So we would have to accept that similar stonework in the same building may end up appearing different over time. 
There's no doubt that this scheme is impressive. The intention to detail and the quality of the material matches those same aspects of the existing building. In another example, the extension to the Tate Modern in London, the architects Herzog and de Morin have not tried to blend anything in. They've picked up on the materials of the existing building, but they have not slavishly copied them. The weight and mass of the original building is somewhat evident in the extension, but this is definitely a project which is not trying to emulate the original. Refurbishment projects usually treat the building as a shell, and it's not uncommon for buildings to be stripped back to expose the base layers of construction and structure before new non-structural changes are implemented. The space in this image could appear entirely differently from one occupier to the next or one company to the next. This type of use does not normally require any changes to be made to the outside of the building, so the character can remain. Internally, services such as power, water and drainage may be rerouted, but the fundamentals of the building will stay the same. For more historically significant buildings, we tend to think of working on them as being some sort of repair exercise. We're generally trying to maintain the building in its original state. This can mean the repair of stonework or brickwork or other masonry to the outside walls, but it could also mean conservation work to historic interiors. Opportunities for improving access to significant historic buildings is more difficult than in the previous examples, unless this can be done without changing the character. In all the previous projects, skilled craftspeople were required to either conserve the existing buildings or to help implement an interpretation of the materials of the existing buildings. As we go forward, and there is a greater emphasis on working within existing buildings, there will be an increased requirement for skilled craftspeople and skilled designers who understand their work. New technologies are becoming more and more useful in documenting and telling the stories of historic buildings. Built environment professionals can use laser and photographic scanning techniques to record every detail of our built environment, and this in turn will allow for work to be planned in greater detail. Working with historic buildings has become a recognised skill by professional bodies, and most, including RICS, SIET and RIBA, maintain a register of practitioners who have specialist knowledge of conservation. Being listed on one of these registers will probably be considered as a commercial advantage in the future. In conclusion, we will all work on existing buildings at some stage in our careers, so understanding how those buildings can continue to be used is an important professional consideration. Choosing between adaptation, extension, refurbishment or repair might need different skills and considerations. For each approach, a good understanding of the building and its construction is fundamental. Working with existing buildings will require professionals to develop new skills and to understand new techniques as well as to work alongside others who retain the craft skills of the past. Future lectures will look at specific examples of construction which pick up on the issues raised in this lecture. Thank you very much for watching and again please feel free to ask me any questions during the studio workshops.